Okay. So, Steve, please take it away. Great. Great. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you for arranging this, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do just going to be a bit of an unusual talk. It's, I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I'll start at a very high level, um, kind of a global macro level, looking at the connection between equity prices and economic activity in the early stages of the pandemic. And there's some interesting patterns there. Um, and then I'm going to transition to um, more, more structural changes in the economy that are generated by COVID. I think there are many, but I'm gonna focus my remarks on what I think is one of the most important, which is the shift to the shift in working arrangements um, towards much greater reliance on working from home in the future. I'll show you some evidence on that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a lot about why I think it will partly stick, why this is a structural change that won't be fully reversed um, even, even after we uh, conquer the pandemic. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the implications. I'm, I'm drawing on work here with um, a large number of co-authors. Um, so uh, this is definitely uh, uh, the product of, of work by myself and many others. Let me um, start by highlighting some results in a paper with Adishi and uh, Liu and, and Simon Shin. And I'll just summarize this briefly in words and then show you some of the evidence. Uh, first point is that a global asserted that if you look at national stock prices and you condition on global developments, um, you also see that uh, national stock prices foreshadow the timing and severity of own country drops in economic activity. Uh, so it's not just, there is a big common component around the globe, uh, but even at a country level, there's uh, some foreshadowing or predictive power in equity prices. So that sounds like, um, you know, maybe some version of efficient markets in play, um, but it turns out that the size of the stock price drop is many, many times larger than what you can get from a standard asset pricing model. And I'll make that point. I don't have a resolution to that puzzle. I'll simply make the point. And then in another piece of evidence that I'll just briefly summarize here, um, when we look across about 35 countries in our data set, we see that stricter lockdown policies are associated with larger declines in national stock prices. And that's even after we condition on the uh, severity of the pandemic in the country and globally after we condition on uh, economic activity as proxy by workplace mobility nationally and globally, and after we condition on um, uh, fiscal support and the debt relief policies. Um, now, I'll skip over the question of whether that means the lockdowns were too strict or not. I think that's a much more complicated question, um, but we'll get into that. So here's the here's the first fact that I mentioned. So this is the the time path of uh, global stock prices and workplace mobility. Um, from uh, February 17th to May 21st. And everything here is done, and this picture is done on a market cap weighted basis. So the US you know, gets something like 40% of the weight in this picture uh, because it's something like 40% of global market capitalization. Um, and the, the, the pattern here is remarkable. Basically stock prices fell about 30% globally um, before anything happened to economic activity as near as we can measure it. Uh, that's the first kind of downward slice here uh, that you see on the right side of this chart. Then there was a period in which stock prices fell another 10% while mobility measures of economic activity collapsed by about 40%. Uh, and then there's, uh, you see, we'll kind of continue to trace out this, uh, clockwise, this, this clockwise path. We see some, some recovery in stock prices as mobility declines further. And then the last segment of this picture, both stock prices and mobility are recovering. Now I'm just showing you the global average picture here, but basically the same story plays out in every country um, that we considered um, except for China, Taiwan, and South Korea. In China, these, the stock price collapse and the economic activity collapse occurred together. Um, perhaps because you know, China was the first country to have a, um, a serious pandemic uh, outbreak here. 
Um, in Taiwan and South Korea, basically in Taiwan, there was no collapse in economic activity. Uh, they were sufficiently successful in controlling the pandemic that they didn't have the collapse in economic activity. Uh, in South Korea, that's true to a lesser extent, okay? But this is a very pronounced pattern. Now, as I said um, earlier, there's, this, is, this is the common global pattern. But even if you condition on common developments, you see elements of this within countries as well. So what I take from the, this analysis is that there's, there's pretty compelling evidence that stock prices foreshadow the uh, collapse in economic activity. Now, um, on the other hand, the, the <clears throat> so that sounds like an efficient markets view, but if you take a standard um, asset pricing model with rare disasters, and here I'm using Barrow's famous model of this, um, and you use it, not you, normally these models are used to explain ex ante risk premiums and the like, and try to try to understand whether rare disasters can rationalize the size of the equity premium over the risk free rate. Um, you can take those same models there and though and say, does it explain the realized collapse in stock prices uh, in light of the realized disaster magnitude? And here I think the answer is pretty clearly no. Um, and the way to see that is. Um, just take the um, asset pricing model, uh, take the and use it to focus on real what it what it says about realized outcomes, rather than uh, expected outcomes. And so that's what this equation does, and just follows from the asset pricing um, equation and the and the law of motion for the forcing process. The forcing process in in barrel setup is uh, is a, a measure of aggregate productivity or aggregate output. This is a drift term in aggregate output. This is, an, this is kind of the normal kind of shock. And then they, you have these occasional rare shocks um, uh, that, have, you know, that, that involve a disaster of size P. And those disasters occur with some probability uh, P per period, okay? So you can take that model and use it um, to look at what the model says will happen to equity prices um, after the disaster hits relative to before, okay? And you can write that, and I'm going to do it over the period. So here's how I'm taking the model of the data. I'm going to I'm going to think about this disaster as uh, as unfolding or becoming known uh, over the period from 17 February um, to 23 March. Why did I pick that period? We'll go back to this chart. Um, here's you know nothing much has happened to asset prices by February 17th. By March 23rd, equity prices have kind of shrunk that they're to their maximum level. So I'm, I'm asking whether the model can rationalize this in light of plausible assumptions about the size of the disaster, okay? So here's, here's the drift piece. The drift piece is tiny, okay? So I'm gonna ignore it in the remaining discussion. Here's the normal shock. That's also tiny um, for any reasonable parameterization of the variability of the regular shocks. So it's all about the size of the disaster, okay? This term here. So then we got to ask ourselves, well, how big was the disaster? In the, in the context of Barrel's model, we should think of the disaster as kind of the present value reduction in the flow of future output, okay? Or the permanent component of the, I shouldn't say the present value, I should say the, the permanent flow component of the reduction in output. Well, you can, you can do various things to try to get a handle on what that is. Here's a very simple exercise. And, and this is looking at the US data. Um, all I've done here is the blue line is just uh, um, real GDP in, uh, per capita in natural log units in the years leading up to the pandemic. Then there's the extrapolation uh, from that log linear path. Here's what actually happened to output. It fell a lot in response to the pandemic. If I take the peak fall, that's right here in the, in the um, third quarter of 2020 relative to the extrapolated trend, I get about 12 log points. Now, I'm in, I'm, my view is that's a very, very generous upper bound on what one would have perceived as the size of the disaster in real time. Why do I say it's a generous upper bound? Because almost everybody expected there to be some considerable bounce back as we um, brought the pandemic under control and as we learned um, about more effective ways to contain the pandemic uh, without killing the economy, or perhaps I should say it more, more accurately, um, we haven't succeeded in containing the pandemic yet, but, we've, but we have learned a bit about how not to kill the economy quite as much as we did in the, in the early stages of the pandemic. So 12 log points 
Um, obviously, that's a lot smaller than this decline, which is 40% or about 50 log points. And that's under a very generous sense of what the size of the pandemic uh, disaster was. You know, maybe a more reasonable estimate is something that's only a quarter of that or half that. So this is the basis of my conclusion that the size of the stock market crash is much greater than comes out of a standard asset pricing model. Um, and I, I'll just leave it at that. There's obviously a lot more to be said there. There's many modifications to the standard model that you can make, but I think this is a pretty straightforward material demonstration that there's something uh, seriously amiss in the standard asset pricing model, uh, at least in this episode, but I think probably not just in this episode. It's just that this episode is so large that we can see it quite clearly. Now, the other thing we do in, in the paper with Simon and Dean Chien is, um, you know, we ask, uh, well, can we account empirically for national stock price movements in the early stages of the pandemic? And there, there's some pretty strong results that come out of our regression analysis. These are just descriptive results. Um, you may or may not want to impute a causal interpretation to them, um, but they do say that when you condition on a whole variety of outcomes within the country and globally, in terms of how much economic activity is happening and is measured by these workplace mobility measures, the severity of the pandemic measured in various ways, and the extent of fiscal policy interventions and debt relief measures, what you find conditional on all those things globally and nationally is that national stock prices are three percentage points lower for each unit standard deviation increase in the stringency of the country's lockdown. And here I'm using the the Oxford data on lockdown stringency, which some of you are probably familiar with. And it's another four and a half points lower um, associate, uh, for each unit standard deviation increase in the global average stringency of these lockdown measures. And these two effects are separate and statistically significant. These are big effects, okay? They don't take you all the way towards explaining that 40% decline in the, in the stock price globally, um, but they're certainly big enough that um, you know, we, we ought to take them seriously. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna, there's lots to be said here and we talk a little bit more in the paper about how to interpret the connection between um, these lockdown interventions and, and non-pharmaceutical uh, policy interventions more generally and stock prices and economic activity. But I'm gonna pass over that and leave that. We can, we can come back to that in the, in the Q&A if you'd like. And I'm going to start to transition now to what's happening within countries. And here I'm going to focus very much on the US because that's the, where I have data. But I think much of what I has to have to say, I think most of it applies with lesser or greater force to other countries around the world. And, and we can also talk on the Q&A about which of these phenomena I'm about to discuss, I think will carry over um, with equal, greater or lesser force to other countries. So thus far, I've shown you these huge movements in national stock prices. That's kind of well known. What's maybe less well appreciated is there's just tremendous variation in firm level stock prices within countries um, uh, happening at the same time. <clears throat> this picture is designed to give you a sense of the magnitude of that firm level variation. There are many pieces of information on this picture. So let me walk you through it one by one. At the most basic level, it's a scatter plot of daily average market returns on the horizontal axis uh, against the cross, the cross security dispersion of equity returns on the same day as measured by the interquartile range of equity returns. Everything here is done on a valuated basis, okay? And, all, and everything here is for the United States stock market. So this is for listed firms in the US. The gray dots here show you all of the trading days in 2019. They're just designed, so these are the gray dots kind of concentrated around here. They're just designed to give you a point of reference, okay? So that's 2019, all days. The red dots are days in which the market moved up or down <clears throat> at least two and a half percent on a single day in the United States. And we pick these thresholds basically because market moves of this size always generate next day discussions in newspapers in which most of the time, the article ventures some explanation of what drove the market move. All of the red dots you see here were attributed by next day newspaper accounts in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times 
to COVID-19 news and news about the economic fallout of COVID. The triangles here were attributed by newspapers to news about monetary policy developments. And then we've got the fiscal policy stimulus. These are, there's four kind of diamonds here. Those are all attributed to news about fiscal policy stimulus. So <clears throat> you can see that most of these dots, in fact, all of them, except for really the Super Tuesday aftermath, that's when Joe Biden had big victories in the primary elections and it, and it became pretty clear that he would be the Democratic nominee. All of the, uh, these other dots basically are traced directly to the pandemic or policy responses to the pandemic, or in the case of the oil price crash, really a fallout of the pandemic. Now, what I want you, what I want you to note though, is um, <clears throat> the size of these. So if I just pick these two, I pick two of the bigger ones. These, the dispersion of stock prices on these two days, the ones I've highlighted here, is 15 standard deviations greater than the average interquartile range in 2019. So this isn't like a three sigma event or a five sigma event or even a 10 sigma event. It's a 15 sigma event, okay? That's how much dispersion there was in the cross section in firm level returns. So what I want you to take from what I've told you so far, huge movements in stock prices at the national level, but beneath that just enormous variation across firms. Now I have a paper with uh, Stephen Hansen and uh, Christian Seminaria Amas that kind of drills into you know, what the, what those structural shifts are. We use some, I think, interesting machine learning methods and text-based methods to do that. I'm going to set most of that aside and just drill in on one dimension, uh, which is the work from, the shift to work from home, okay? So that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. Um, first of all, first point I want to make about that shift is it's, it's very evident in, in equity markets. In the structure, in the structure of uh, return shifts in the equity markets, so this is not this is a picture not drawn drawn from my paper, um, but from another paper. But it's very much in the spirit of some results in my paper with Hansen and Seminario Ames. And what 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 they've done here, and this is from um, Schmidt and Papanicolo. What they've done here is divide um, listed firms in the United States into five categories: uh, those who were in producing essential products. That's the red line here. And they took all of the, everybody else and they sorted them into industries uh, based on quartiles of, of um, ability of their workers to work from home using the kind of Dingle and Neiman measures. <clears throat> and so what you see here, so this would be the top quartile, this, this lot, the black line at the black dash line at the top. These are firms in industries where a large fraction of workers can work from home. And then at the bottom here, these are industries like leisure, hospitality, um, <clears throat> restaurants, where a small fraction, only a small fraction can work from home. So what you see here is this, this enormous dispersion um, across these quartiles of firms. And again, they're ranked by the capacity of their workers to work from home. That, that emerged very quickly, basically within the first two months after the pandemic hit. And then it's largely remained. Um, it's shrunk only a little bit, um, well, actually not much at all. And so the, the point I want you to take away from this picture is even after stock markets recovered, and as I didn't show you the recovery, but they did recover, this structural shift in the markets stayed the same. So that's from equity markets. Now, when we go to employers and we ask them, we uh, survey employers, um, we see the same kind of pattern at work. Okay. so. What, what we've done here, this is from the Survey of Business Uncertainty. It's, um, it's a survey that asks both current backward-looking and forward-looking questions of um, businesses in the United States. So it's got coverage of all major industry sectors, all firm size classes, all 50 US states. It's a panel survey that I've, I've been involved in designing and implementing uh, monthly, but the Atlanta Fed is, is the organization that fields this survey every month. <clears throat> so here, we're making use of questions where we ask the employers each month, we ask them, what's your current employment? What was your employment 12 months ago? And what do you expect your employment to be 12 months from now? Okay, so we have a 20, so we can look back, we can look back and forward over an interval that's 24 months. So we've taken that data, uh, that it's a combination of past plus expected employment growth over a 24 month period. 
And we looked at the period before the pandemic hit, okay? That's these gray bars and after the pandemic hit, okay? So notice that we're capturing both recent trends and, and expectations about the future, okay? That's why I've labeled this past plus expected future employment growth. If you take our data in the pre-pandemic period, it goes back to September, 2016, and you relate the capacity to work from home as measured by Dingle and Neiman to these employment growth trends, there's no correlation across industries. Okay, it's completely uncorrelated. If you do the same exercise in the post-pandemic period, you get a correlation of 0.71, okay? And by that, I mean that industries where there's a high capacity to work from home have experienced more rapid employment growth and expect to experience more rapid employment growth going forward in the, post, in the period since the pandemic struck. So this is just from the employment side telling a very similar story to what the equity price uh, data uh, were saying. Now, <clears throat> let me get into the shift to working from home. Those two previous charts were partly motivation. The a key thing to understand about this um, working from home shift isn't just that it was a huge shift, but but two other things. It was it was compulsory in some sense. There wasn't really much of a choice. And uh, second, it involved experimentation at scale in a way that allowed you to allowed employers and workers to experiment in an environment where everybody else was working at home. And that's quite important <clears throat> because basically suppose you're a law firm and you wanna experiment with working from home. Um, well, you can't really tell your clients that we're gonna do everything, whoops, we're gonna do everything remotely um, because you can conduct an experiment with your own firm, maybe some subset of your associates work from home, but you can't make your clients work from home at the same time. During the COVID crisis though, with so many people and so many organizations mostly working from home, you, you, you overcame these coordination challenges. So it's an experimentation at the individual level, at the organization level, and at the societal level. I think that's quite important to understand because we learn a lot of things by that kind of large scale experimentation that we would not have learned otherwise. Now there are lots of problems and challenges that come from working from home these are all, these are slides, <laughs> pictures from Nick Bloom. These are two of his grad students working from home. They live in small grad student accommodations. They only way, the only way they can find, uh, the only place they can find at home to actually work without too many distractions is in the closet. Um, <clears throat> this is Nick's daughter interrupting him while he's on a conference call. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, I think her name is Chloe, but I've, I've met her. She's a, she's a very uh, outspoken child and so, I'm sure she's asking her dad, you know, what's going on. So that's just indicative of some of the challenges. Now, what, what I've done with Nick and uh, Jose is we've been running a survey since May, about once a month. <clears throat> we, thus far, we've surveyed about 20,000 U.S. workers. Um, we're, we're, we've got December data, but it's not going to be incorporated in the slides that I'm going to show you today. And we're just about to go to field with the January data um, uh, in the next few days. But let me tell you what we do. We are randomly sampling US residents who are between 20 and 64 years of age who earned at least 20,000 uh, by working in 2019. So that's, that's the population we're targeting. We reweight our sample to match the current population survey at the earnings by industry by state level. In our survey, we ask about 40 questions. Uh, we get basic information on demographics we're mostly focused on the extent of working from home during the COVID pandemic and their desires and plans after the COVID. We, get, we also ask a lot of questions about their experience and their perspective on working from home. So I'm gonna draw on that survey extensively for, for my remaining remarks. <clears throat> First thing to understand about working from home and um, is, it, is the incidence of working from home is very steeply rising in education, very steeply rising in income. This is now well-established fact. Basically all the surveys that have been done of working from home find this pattern, but I just want you to take note of how, how dramatic these differences are. Um, you know, people like in this audience um, with a graduate degree, uh, more than half of them have been working from home in recent months. Whereas if you look at, <clears throat> look at folks with less than a high school education, it's only 10%. So a very steeply rising uh, profile here. Now, 
the second thing I want you to notice is that um, most workers, the vast majority of workers think that the option to work from home is a valuable perk, okay? Uh, that comes through loud and clear in our, in our survey. Um, you can see that uh, um, you know, basically uh, something like uh, 60, 60, 65% of the people we survey think that the option to work from home two to three days per week is worth um, uh, a lot. You know, many of them think it's worth more than 10% of their pay. Okay, that's a huge number, but it's, it's roughly in line on average with um, this uh, well-known study by Moss and Palais, which, is, which was focused on call center workers. This, I'm not gonna show you the underlying data. This is very broadly too, true across demographic groups, across education, across income, pro, income classes. So there's a strong desire to work from home on the part of most workers. Um, when we ask workers though, what does their employer plan for them to do? So this is one of our key forward looking questions. We asked the workers in this survey, um, in 2021 or later, after COVID, how often would you like to have paid work days at home? This is the distribution we get. I didn't put the planned one here. I'm gonna show you the planned later. So this is what they would like to do, but I'll also draw on data on what their employers plan for them to do in one of the things that I show you later. Now, here is, um, here's some evidence on how much working from home um, people are doing during the pandemic, how much they did before the pandemic, and what their work, what their employers plan for them to do after the pandemic is over. So this pre-pandemic point, this is drawn from the American Time Use Survey. This is a large representative sample done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Those data say that uh, in 2017 and 2018, only about 5% of full paid work days were performed at home. Okay, so that's the pre-pandemic situation. In the, and then, and then everything else here is from our survey. Um, in the immediate wake of the pandemic, more than half of all work that was being performed was being performed at home, okay? That drifted down over time um, until November, December, when in the United States, uh, the pandemic uh, severity worsened again and it went back up. Now, throughout this period, we've been asking workers, what does your employer's plan for you to do after the pandemic is over? That's where we get our key forward looking number. The number that comes out of that is 23% of paid work days by full-time employees will be done at home according to our survey after the pandemic is over. So the survey results say there's gonna be a permanent four to five, time, uh, four to five times uh, that after the pandemic is over, working from home will be four to five times larger uh, than it was before the pandemic. That's a huge shift. Now, why do we think it'll stick? Aside from just that's what workers will say, um, economists are often skeptical of survey evidence um, about what people will do in the future. Um, but we've also got evidence on several mechanisms that I wanna share with you briefly. And I'm, I'm mindful of time, so here, I'm gonna just show you some of the evidence, but here are nine reasons why we think working from home will stick. We've got evidence in support of most of these, okay? So I'm gonna very quickly show you some of them. First, um, this, uh, this forced experimentation point. For the vast majority, uh, excuse me, for about 40% or 50%, I should say, I'm just adding up these top three bars. For about half of all workers, working from home has turned out better than they expected. And that is an indication that the that that prior views were somewhat biased negatively with respect to working from home. Okay, that, that's the first point. Um, second point is when we ask workers how much time and expenses they have incurred um, to enable more effective working from home um, in their in their personal home in their own homes and we add up those numbers, it amounts to about 1.2% of annual GDP. Okay, so that's a non-trivial investment chunk. We don't have direct evidence on pandemic-induced investments that enable working from home um, on business premises, but there is a clue in the national income accounts. If you look at fixed investments in information processing equipment and software, the kinds of things that firms need to invest in to make uh, working from home work 
basically, and they need backend uh, security systems and communications uh, software and so on, you see a big spike since the pandemic. So that's consistent with the view that not only has there been investments at home that enable working from home, but there have been investments on the business premises to enable working from home and more generally to enable remote interactivity. Third thing uh, that comes out of our survey, there's been a basically a collapse in the stigma associated with working from home. Um, it's, it's an open question as to how much that, uh, whether that stigma will return after the pandemic is over. But right now the stigma is basically, basically vanished uh, and it was a big deal beforehand. Our respondents also tell us that uh, many of them say they will um, continue to avoid crowded elevators, public transportation, taxis, and so on after the pandemic is over. And that suggests even after a vaccine arrives, okay? So many people just uh, fear, they'll have a lingering fear of infection and that'll affect their attitudes about where they work. And then I think one of the most interesting pieces of evidence, this is from a, another paper with Nick and a grad student at Chicago who's on the market this year, Yulia Zestkova. What we've done here is we've gone to patent application data. And um, so for those of you who don't know, the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office Every week, they issue uh, the full text of newly published patent applications. And it tells you when the patent application was filed. It contains a text of the, the title of the patent application, but also a description of what the new technological innovation is, does, what its applications are, and so on. So we have downloaded all of those patent applications. There's a few, few million of them since January uh, 2010. And we have basically designed a simple algorithm to classify those patent applications as they're either, they're, they're about technologies that support working from home or they're about something else. They're about other technologies. It's a very simple way. We basically come up with a simple dictionary that contains uh, words like teleworkable employment, uh, remote communications, um, things like that. You can read our paper if you want to see the exact list. Uh, and then we use that to classify the flow of new patents. And what I'm showing you in this picture is the share of new patent applications by month that advance technologies that support working from home. So here's January, here's February, by which time the pandemic had already struck China and it was well known. You can already see some uptick and then the latest data that's available to us is September of 2020. You can see this very clear upward trajectory. Uh, the share of patents that advanced technology that support working from home has more than doubled since January and it remains on a clear upward trajectory. What I take from this is that COVID has shifted the direction of technical, technical change in ways that are likely to make working from home work even better in the future than it does now. Now, briefly, some implications. Um, as I said before, pretty much across the whole earning spectrum, there's a desire to work from home about two days a week. That would be the modal response, okay? That's these black, black lines here. I've got annual earnings buckets on the horizontal scale here. So this is what people say they would like to do after the pandemic is over, that's the black. This is what people say their employers plan for them to do. And what you can see uh, consistent with this evidence that currently it's the better educated higher income people who are mostly working from home that after the pandemic is over, their employers plan for those people to continue working from home quite a bit, but they don't plan for less educated workers to work from home so much. So remember, there's a strong desire to work from home, but the people who are going to benefit from that are disproportionately better educated, higher, uh, higher income folks. So I think there are, so the, the point of this slide is the, the benefits of the shift to working from home are going to go to uh, higher income, better educated people. Now, I wanna show you some evidence um, on productivity. And uh, we, we, um, we, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw on two pieces of information that comes out of the sample. One is this question about how often is your employer planning for you to work from home 
after the pandemic is over. Here's the structure of that question. But we also ask people, how productive have you been working from home relative to how productive you were working in, on the premises? We take these two questions. So in other words, what employers plan plus the answer to this question to calculate um, the productivity gains from re-optimizing working arrangements after the pandemic is over, okay? So um, this is just a distribution of responses to the second question. But now I'm gonna take the first question and the second question, put them together and I get the following. If we simply said, we're gonna re-optimize and take everybody who says they can work from home more efficiently than they can work on the premise and have them work from home, we, that, that would generate a 4% increase in productivity, four percentage point increase. When we though recognize that some people who say they are more productive at home aren't actually gonna be working from home under their employer's plan, we get a 2.3 percentage point increase, okay? So I mentioned this as just indicative of um, the potential productivity gains that result from this massive experiment. Now I realize there are many other productivity effects associated with the pandemic, but at least here's one silver lining. Less commuting, that's a big deal. Obviously, um, I'm gonna make one more point and then stop. Um, there's potentially serious implications for um, cities, especially um, central business districts that uh, where, where many people commute into the city and then they spend money uh, while they're working or after work or before work. So we've taken our data and just um, done some back of the envelope calculations for say Manhattan and San Francisco. Uh, and what we've done, so one of our questions, we ask workers, how much do you spend near your place of employment on a typical day when you commute to work, okay? And that, that's in Manhattan, that's about, that works out to about $283 per week per commuter, okay? And that's on spending on restaurants, coffee shops, entertainment, after work, um, personal services, and so on. So if we take that number and we put it together with the number of people who commuted into Manhattan before pandemic, the, the number who will no longer be commuting into Manhattan after the pandemic, according to our survey evidence, put all that together, you get about a 10% drop in worker spending in Manhattan due to the post-pandemic shift from working from home as compared to the pre-pandemic shift. So that's a lot, that's a large drop in sales revenue uh, for, for New York City. Uh, and of course, property values and rents may also decline, people may move out. I'm mindful of time, so I'm, I'm just gonna uh, stop here with, uh, with this slide. Basically, our survey evidence say there will be a big shift to working from home. We've also got evidence on several mechanisms behind that shift. And I briefly talked about some of the implications uh, for cities, for productivity, uh, and uh, for the distribution of the benefits associated for, with uh, working from home. So let me stop. Let me stop here and take questions and comments. <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing here now so I can see folks. Okay, so so thank you very much. Um, I send a text out to everyone, please uh, pass on uh, your questions. Um, I don't know if that's working, so we might actually try to get people to uh, unmute uh, and turn their video on if they have a they have a question or a comment. But before they do that, um, thanks, Steve, for your your presentation. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, the stock market. So you, your comments were mainly about the, the beginning um, and, not, and not really so much about uh, what's been happening recently. Um, some of the news uh, about these different variants uh, of the virus, uh, about it potentially being more infectious, you know, the reference to the UK variant and, and then there's been some other news reports about the South African variant uh, possibly uh, challenging um, how 
the efficacy of existing vaccines and so on. But when you look at those news reports, um, despite the fact that we're seeing obviously cases uh, increase and and some hospitalization uh, systems being even challenged, uh, we don't see very much, or at least I can't see very much uh, in terms of equity markets or the narrative really factoring into what's going on in, in equity markets. So I've, do you have any do you have any comments about that? Yeah, a um, couple things. It's you know I I went uh, kind of back and forth between equity markets and real activity, but of course equity markets um, are not representative of the economy as a whole. Uh, that's that's always true, but I, it's especially true in in some aspects of the current situation. So, you know, in the U.S. and U.K. and a handful of other countries. You know, we've got pretty well developed equity markets, but even in the United States, um, country I know best, less than a quarter of private sector employees work for listed firms. Okay, so I think it's worth keeping that in mind. There's a huge chunk of the economy that doesn't work for listed firms. And so we need to think about the mapping from equity prices to the economy as a whole, the labor market as a whole. I haven't done a systematic study. Um, but it seems pretty clear just from um, an impressionistic look that the stock market is particularly, uh, the US stock market at least, and I suspect this is true in other countries around the world, is particularly overrepresented in the set of firms that are poised to benefit from the shift to working from home, uh, from the, the shift to uh, cloud-based activities um, and uh, remote interactions generally. If you think about restaurants, personal services, small scale lodging, um, these, these are firms that uh, are, and they're, they're firms that are not listed for, not listed. But that's the part of the economy that has been hit most severely um, by the pandemic. Uh, so I think there's um, the unrepresentative nature of the stock market um, is part of the answer to your question about why the market has done so well in recent months and even in recent weeks in the light of the negative evidence about um, new strains of the of the virus and and I guess you know the questions about the efficacy of some of the vaccines that have been put out. So that, I think that's part of the answer. Um, we tried to get at this in our survey of business uncertainty, um, which is more representative of the economy as a whole. I didn't talk about it today, but um, we have a short paper coming out that um, looks at subjective uncertainty measures about future sales outcomes of businesses. And what we see there are some, first of all, a couple of things. First, I'll tell you the unsurprising one and then maybe the more interesting one. The unsurprising thing is once the pandemic hit, the subjective uncertainty expressed by businesses exploded. Um, and I should say a word about how we get that measure. So in our survey, when we ask businesses forward-looking questions, we don't just get a point estimate from them. We recover a five-point probability distribution. So it's a subjective forecast distribution over their own future outcomes. Well, we can use that subjective forecast distribution to construct a subjective standard deviation about expected future sales growth rates for every firm. We do that for every firm in our panel, and then we aggregate over firms in a sales-weighted basis to get an economy-wide measure. That's the subjective uncertainty measure I'm talking about. That measure fans out dramatically once the pandemic hit, and it has stayed high ever since. But what shifted is that in the early months after the pandemic hit, the, risk was mo the, the perceived risk was mostly to the downside. In the last several months, the risk has shifted mostly to the upside. So we see that even when we look for, you know, a more representative sample of the economy as a whole, there are many businesses, not all, but many businesses who see considerable upside risk going up, going, going forward. And, and that suggests that, you know, some of this optimism that seems so evident in the stock market is also present in a large, share, and by large, I mean accounting for a sizable share of US sales, 
a large share of the of the US private sector. So that optimism might be misplaced, but our survey evidence, the stock market evidence suggests that there is quite a bit of optimism out there. So I guess uh, the natural question in response to that is we've had all these uh, highly uh, stimulatory policies and if they are being applied you know, on economies that you know, where things are going to bounce back, uh, you know, we could get uh, bounce back in things like long-term bond deals um, and so on. Um, so one of the things I want to talk to, talk to you about was the data that you used in your stock market paper uh, was these Google uh, workplace um, mobility measures. Um, right. We've been looking at those uh, recently, and they've they've weakened as well, um, especially in European uh, countries. Uh, do you follow those? And and that seems to be a bit of a disconnect with what's going on in equity. So we have rising rising COVID cases. Uh, we have these activity measures from Google um, that are that are declining. Um, we have lockdown measures that people are either doing or talking about. Um, so are you monitoring these data uh, in real time? Uh, I'm, I'm not monitoring them intensively in real time, but um, you know, certainly looking at them some. And I, let me just offer one thought. I, I am confident, partly because I've communicated with uh, Larry Schmidt about this at MIT, the, you know, I drew on his work earlier, I asked him the following question. I said, Larry, if you take your data um, and you reweight the equity prices um, by industry level employment shares, um, does that substantially mitigate? So instead of doing a market cap weighted uh, stock market price index, which is what we usually do, that's kind of the standard approach, you do an employment, right? at, the, at the firm level, you weight by employment. If you do that, you get a lot less bounce back. Now, I don't think it fully explains the phenomenon you're, you're describing. But what that says to me is it just reinforces my earlier, earlier previously expressed view that part of the reason for the disconnect between the stock market and the rest of the economy is because the stock market underrepresents the sectors of the economy mm. where, that are really getting hammered. And those are sectors of the economy with, that account for a big share of jobs, even though they might account for a more modest share of GDP and a tiny share of equity market capitalization. So I think that is part of the answer to your question. I don't think it's the full answer to your question, but, but what, what I think we need, what, one thing we need, and uh, I haven't seen anybody do this, maybe I'll take it on myself. We need a systematic effort to isolate, you know, to build a stock market index that is, is optimized to try to track the real economy, either in an output weighted sense or an employment weighted sense. And then to take the remaining gap and view that as the kind of puzzle to be explained that you are mentioning. Um, I'm not sure why we haven't done that as a profession. It's not that hard. I mean, it's a fair bit of data work, but it's it's not that hard a thing to do. Um, and maybe I'll, maybe you're, I'm gonna talk myself into trying to do it myself on a systematic up uh, regular basis. Um, Beyond that, you know, why, why this, op, this what appears to be undue optimism? Uh, let me just note that it's, um, it's the mirror image of what I started out with um, in the beginning of my talk. Um, and I tried to make quite clear the magnitude of the stock market drop was greatly in excess of anything you can explain from a standard asset pricing model. And one way to think about this, we don't say this in the paper, but one way to think about this is go back to Schiller's original demonstration that stock prices move around way too much to be explained, to be rationalized as the outcome of, of, of uh, revisions and the expectations about future dividends. Um, so Schiller was making an ex ante point, but you can, you can see the, you can interpret the recent stock market crash and then possibly excessive recovery as kind of realized versions of the excess volatility point that, that Schiller was making a long time ago. Usually we, we make those points in an ex ante sense rather than an ex post sense because 
ex post, there's so many things happening, we can't really figure out what's what's doing what. But in this in this case, in the last year, we kind of know what the big shock was at some at some very basic level. It was it was the pandemic, and that we and we have some sense that prospects of recovery for the pandemic were driving up the the stock market. So you might you might think of the evidence that I showed and the puzzle you mentioned as just one more realization or manifestation of the puzzle that Schiller identified uh, decades ago and, and which has spawned an enormous amount of work in asset pricing about which people in finance and macro continue to argue vociferously. I don't think we have a clear resolution to those puzzles. Okay, good, thanks. So one of the questions uh, that we just received was, have you considered the implications of COVID-19 shocks on employment across borders? Um, so you never, I don't think you really brought in the international dimension. No, I didn't. Um, I'm th I appreciate that question a lot because it's a great one. I think, I, I think the U.S. evidence, there's some, there's some aspects of the U.S. evidence that will translate internationally and some much less so. So let's think, for example, about the, um, about the um, impact on the stigma associated with working from home and the lingering fear, fear of infection risk. It seems pretty likely that those two effects will carry over to other countries insofar as they had very bad experiences with the pandemic. So in the UK, for example, which had an even worse experience than the United States, I would expect those kinds of effects to be quite powerful. And of course, London also has a commuting culture, just like the just like uh, San Francisco and New York. So in settings like that, I expect it to be, um, you know, to carry over very directly. But if you go to places like South Korea or to a lesser extent, Germany, um, they've had a much weaker pandemic. They've done, they've done a better job of containing it. I don't, I don't anticipate that those kind of psychological and, and attitudinal shifts will be as large in the wake of the pandemic um, as they are likely to be in the United States. Um, let's take the, another example is, let's take the, the technological shifts. Okay, I showed you some evidence that um, the pandemic has redirected technical change. Now, ideas, technologies can eventually flow across international borders. So it, it'll probably take longer before those technological shifts play out in, other, in many other countries. But I expect that those shifts over the next decade will eventually alter working arrangements in a rather serious, rather significant degree in advanced economies around the world, even ones that didn't have as severe as a pandemic as the United States. Okay, so I see um, there are some people on my screen, Michael Bordeaux and Steve Ambler and so on. So Michael- Are you Steve, hearing me? Yes, can you? Okay. Are we okay? Michael, I'm sure you have some comments or, or some questions or Steve. Um, there's a number of people. Michael, you're muted. And you know, we can't see your handsome visit. There he is. Okay. No, I think this uh, Michael, is Michael, I think you're muted. I can hear you, Michael. No, I'm not muted. No, I, I think I I think I think this is uh, this is really great. And I think that the um, the conclusions you get that there is gonna be a permanent shift in the workforce, that's definitely gonna happen. Um, What's kind of what kind of time frame do you have for um, uh, for the recovery, and and secondly, um, how like how are people going to adjust? I mean, you talked about two groups: those people like us uh, or our students, uh, well educated, and this will be great for us. But what about the rest? Um, how's that going to work out? My, my signal dropped and I missed the first part of your question. I heard 
I heard, how is it going to work out for the rest of folks? Okay, my first part was about the time frame of the adjustment, okay, in the future. Like, how, what do you think that's going to happen, both in terms of the recovery and how, you know, how this adjustment's going to, going to the dynamics of it into the future. And the second is the distribution, the question of the, you know, of, of our students and high educated people versus a lot of others. How's that gonna, how's that gonna play out? Because it seems yeah. like they're really serious issues there of distribution. There are. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, thank you for that. Um, on the first one about the timing, I, th this is a key issue for policymakers, especially as macroeconomists we are, we tend to think in terms of monetary policy, fiscal policy and um, at a high level um, sometimes macro prudential policies, but I worry a lot that um, you know the, the the stimulus policies at some point they they will be withdrawn, um, and we we need to be thinking more in my view about facilitating some of the structural changes that need to take place. Um, I don't think we're going to go back to as much business travel as we used to have uh, anytime in the next few years. And that means uh, less spending on certain kinds of lodging and, and restaurants uh, and so on. I don't think we're gonna be commuting as much um, into central business districts. Again, that has consequences for where dollars get spent and where jobs are, are located. Um, there are probably going to be fewer jobs in the airline industry, in the hotel industry, uh, maybe, maybe in the restaurant industry. So um, I think it's important we think about facilitating the, those structural shifts and not just imagine that once we've deployed the vaccine, we're going to somehow go back to the economy we knew um, in 2019 um, and that all we need to do is carry people over till then. I, I think that's a short-sighted approach, um, but I do see a lot of macroeconomic policy analysis kind of of that sort. Um, so I'm very much in favor of trying to um, uh, allow and facilitate uh, reallocation. Um, and it's one reason I, I'm more in favor of income support for people than policies that are designed to preserve jobs because some of the jobs aren't coming back. Uh, I also think we need to understand that a lot of this adjustment activity is, is going to occur at the very micro level. It's repurposing commercial space in, in, in inside cities. Um, so that has to do with things like business licensing and zoning regulations. Uh, they have an important role to play in facilitating um, the adjustment process. Um, and so that's not really a macro policy, but it, it has uh, potentially important macro consequences this time around. You know, in the United States, I've argued that um, we need to think about relaxing occupational licensing restrictions and of the sort. And this gets on to your second question the kinds of people who are most hit by the pandemic um, tend to have um, less education. They tend to be in middle income and lower, lo, lo, middle wage and lower wage jobs. Um, those are folks, we gotta make it easier for those folks to find new, new types of employment if they aren't going back to their old types of employment or their old job and their old location. And I don't see, at least in the United States, I don't see enough attention to that. Uh, I see most of the attention devoted to kind of macro level fiscal stimulus policies, which I agree is part of the package. Um, but that, that part of the package is going to end at some point. And we need to be prepared to help out those people unless we want them to become permanent wards of the state, um, which is you know, not a good thing. So, um, you know, I don't, we, in the United States, the labor force, the employment rate is still uh, a few million below what it was before the pandemic. And I'm, I'm worried that that might be the case for many years to come. Okay, I, I just wanna pick up a little bit uh, on Michael's point. Um, you have some colleagues at uh, Chicago Booth, which have also come up with a very nice paper, helping us to think through what are the, you know, what are the demand uh, versus the supply effects uh, of the COVID-19 shocks. And the argument, you know, quite simply is that the principal shock is a, is a shock to supply, but because it's affecting uh, a lot of sectors uh, and the 
And really the question is, are people able to substitute to other things? Or is this really causing a big contraction in aggregate demand that's falling you know, by more than aggregate supply? And so that's why one way of, of sort of justifying why we need macro policy support, you know, aside from the income support of the people that are, that are just being directly affected, that it's, that it's truly a macro. Now, according to your story, uh, if that's the case and we come back and people become optimistic, you know, it's going to be like the, the roaring 20s after the, no, I, I don't. I don't personally uh, share that view. I think maybe the, the stock market is, is probably uh, too optimistic, just like it was too pessimistic uh, in, the early, in the early phases of, of this. But do you, like in terms of your work, do you have any comments uh, in terms of thinking about this more as a, like a macroeconomist and thinking yeah. about through the open well, stabilization or unemployment stabilization yeah, role? Um, yeah, let me policies. let me pick up on on the paper that you mentioned. I think you're talking about work by Veronica Garrieri and others. Um, one of my colleagues. I think that's important work. Um, but there is a there's a there's actually a comp. It's often the the policy debates are often positioned as, do we want aggregate demand stimulus uh, due to this kind of problem you just identified, or do we want to facilitate um, an adjustment process? I see the two as complementary. Because in those models, as I understand it, um, they're, they're typically the base case is one in which workers are stuck in sectors. They don't move at all, okay? Um, and that's part of the source of the aggregate demand decline. When you, you, you're disrupted, the supply, the supply is disrupted in certain sectors, so people are earning less and they have less to spend. That's, that's a part of the aggregate demand uh, reduction. Well, there's no reason why we can't allow and facilitate, say, the unemployed bartender to start delivering groceries, okay, um, through Uber Eats or something like that, or to take a job in an Amazon warehouse. The, the policies we adopted in the United States, especially the Unemployment Insurance Benefits Program, um, discouraged that kind of short-term reallocation. Um, I think if we had instead encouraged that type of short-term reallocation, um, we would have mitigated, I don't know how much, but we would have somewhat mitigated the negative aggregate demand effects that um, arise in those models. So, so I think, so just let me, let me try to be clear. As I understand it, the negative aggregate demand effects that arises in those models is mitigated insofar as we can productively redeploy factors from the sectors where they've been disrupted in supply and move them to other sectors. Now, in many cases, that's not very feasible to do in the short term, but in some cases it is. So I don't see these kind of adjustment facilitating policies as alternatives to standard macro stabilization policies. I actually see them as complements. And in particular, I think to the extent that we can facilitate a productive reallocation of resources, both temporarily and maybe permanently over the longer term, it actually mitigates the macro stabilization challenge that, that you highlighted in your question. Steve, we had a conversation yesterday. You had some concerns about uh, fiscal policy and, and you're on the, uh, the, the, it's sort of the mock monetary policy council in Canada. So you're thinking about monetary policy. Do you have any, any comments on this? Uh, well, actually, I mean, I have a couple of questions related to the, the discussion. Uh, I could come up with some monetary policy related questions as well, but uh, related to what's just been said, I mean, I, it makes me think of this uh, old literature from the 1980s, uh, which I think has kind of disappeared, which might be due for a revival. And the question would be for Steve or anyone else in the audience that knows whether this is the case, uh, it reminds me of the sectoral, sh uh, sectoral shocks models of Lillian and Co. Uh, maybe, maybe it's time for those to be brought back in terms of modeling the business cycle because what's as has been pointed out, what's been going on is uh, a massive amount of uh, short-term and potentially long-term sectoral reallocation. Uh, second question is, I know Steve is uh, known among other things for uh, measures of policy uncertainty. So a question I have is, 
have you managed to relate? Uh, you know, we've, we've gone from two weeks to flatten the curve to locking down for a month to then another month being added on. Uh, have you managed to incorporate uh, the uncertainty about uh, new phases of lockdowns or extensions of lockdowns into your measures of policy uncertainty? So great, great question. So um, I wrote my dissertation on and was motivated by David Lillian's work. Okay. And when I ask myself, what's the nearest parallel to the pandemic recession in the last, I don't know, since World War II, I don't think there's any close parallels. But in some respects, as you suggested, the 74-75 recession is the closest parallel. And that was one that motivated Lillian's work um, in, in considerable uh, degree. So what was the character of that recession? Well, we had a giant oil price shock in 73, 74 that triggered a very large and fairly persistent shift in the relative price of energy, petroleum products in particular. And I do think that um, that, is, so that, that's the sense in which it's, I don't want, it's not a close parallel, but it's the closest precursor in the last half century or more to the pandemic uh, recession in terms of the structural shifts that it calls for. Now we had a long and difficult recovery in, in the United States and many of the other advanced economies around the world uh, in response to the uh, oil price shock. And part of it had to do with um, the painful structural shifts that were triggered by the major shifts in, in uh, the relative cost of energy. So that's, um, that's a bit of a worrisome note. Um, on the other hand, um, the kinds, there are also some important differences that might lead you to be more optimistic. The sectors that got heavily hit in uh, 74, 75 were capital intensive sectors in many cases like the auto industry, um, um, energy, uh, use, energy using in production or energy using in consumption type industries. Those tended to be very capital intensive, lots of sunk investments, unionized workforces, and also a lot of specialized workers in those sectors. That's much less true this time around. Um, the sectors that have been hammered are sectors in which there's always a lot of worker flows and job flows. You know, jobs aren't so, so um, they aren't nearly as, um, employment relationships don't tend to last as long in leisure and hospitality and restaurants as they do in the manufacturing sector. So we might think that there's less sunkness of the investments, um, both capital and labor in the sectors that have been hit hard this time as compared to the sectors that were hit hard in uh, the 74, 75 recession. I mean, so, so therefore we might, we might get- minor exceptions you might want to think of would be uh, airline fleets and big hotels. But uh, I think generally speaking- that's Yeah, true. yeah, no, I, I, take that, I take that point. And um, airlines and uh, you know, I'm on record from the beginning saying that trying to, trying to spend tens of billions of dollars, which we did in the US, to preserve jobs in the airline industry was a mistake. I mean, that, that, was, that was a clear case where many of the jobs were not coming back. And we basically spent tens of billions of taxpayer dollars to tell airline workers, instead of going to look for another job, just wait around for a year. Uh, and we've given them false hopes in many cases. So uh, th that's, that's, a, that's a great example of a bad policy, which in my view, which has slowed down the the reallocation response rather than facilitating it. Um, so I, I'm very much on board with you uh, in, in that respect. Now, um, but back continuing to parallel and, and thinking about, uh, you know, the post-war landscape, the United States, um, you know, we think, it, we often think of it as a relatively flexible economy compared to Europe. And that may be true. It's a lot less flexible than it used to be. You know, we have occupational licensing restri restrictions, certificate of need laws, um, zoning regulations, um, land use restrictions more generally at the state and local level. Um, these have all grown tremendously in the, in the last 50 years in the United States. So the kind of um, really tremendously rapid response, uh, adjustment response that the US economy made in the demobilization after, the World War, after World War II I don't think our economy is capable of that kind of rapid response today. And I think largely because of the way the policy landscape has shifted. 
So this is why I keep coming back to these themes, themes like relaxing occupational licensing restrictions, um, making, making sure that business zoning laws and, and licensing uh, uh, decisions are sufficiently sensitive to the need to quickly redeploy um, the uses of land, the uses of commercial space, why well, I think it's gonna be a critical part of the adjustment process um, this time around. Um, again, that's not the kind of thing macroeconomists are accustomed to thinking about. So I think it kind of gets lost in, the, in a lot of the policy discussions. On your second, on your second question, you know, I have, um, yeah, I've definitely been working on the, on the policy uncertainty front as well. Um, and, and also just measuring uh, economic uncertainty more generally. I kind of already, as I indicated already, we see across many different sources, including the VIX, including the newspaper-based uh, uncertainty measures, including our survey-based measures, um, uncertainty rose dramatically in the wake of the pandemic. Um, it dropped somewhat um, by uh, May or June, but, it, but it then it kind of stabilized at a permanently high level. Um, and there's lots of evidence, both recent and historic, that uncertainty tends to, not surprisingly, discourage investments uh, in physical capital it probably also discourages investments in more intangible forms of capital, um, probably discourages workers from uh, relocating to take advantage of job opportunities that might be available elsewhere. So anything we can do to provide a, um, a more transparent, clear picture of how policy will deal with um, the, uh, this pandemic and future pandemics that might emerge how the vaccine rollout will happen and so on, uh, those things are likely to help the economy recover. I can't put a number on how much they'll help, um, <clears throat> but certainly we don't want policy to be an, an added source of uncertainty on top of the uncertainty that's already brought about by the pandemic itself. And I have to say in the United States, I don't think we've done a very good job of providing clarity about you know, just how on, I'm not talking about monetary policy and fiscal policy now, I'm talking about more uh, direct policies related to um, trying to contain the pandemic, trying to roll out the vaccine. Um, it's hardly been a model of clarity uh, and transparency and organization in the United States in those respects. And many other countries have also, I think, fallen short um, in that regard. So here again, it's not the standard macroeconomic policy toolkit that we normally think about. But for this particular recession, part of the recovery path will be influenced by these non-standard tools, how well they are used, how well they're communicated, how well they're implemented, and whether we can try to provide um, at least some greater degree of confidence and, uh, and not certainty, but less uncertainty about, about policy going forward. All, all of that is, um, I think, to the, to the benefit if we can achieve it. So again, we have to, we have to as macroeconomists, we got to get, we have, we have to recognize there's, there's important roles for monetary and fiscal policy. But in this recession, more than most others, these other policies are going to matter a great deal um, for macroeconomic recovery. So, um... Just a, just a few remarks about, um, about the Lillian work. Um, so he developed uh, a simple measure based on dispersion uh, to basically explain the US uh, cycle. Um, I think it's fair to say that it didn't really catch. Um, so are you optimistic that those ideas given the pandemic will catch more in terms of how we think about no, the, formulating yeah, policy? Well, thank you for that question. So that's, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you give me an opportunity to speak to that. I think part of the reason Lillian's um, work didn't really catch on is because um, when you look more deeply at where the, where the adjustment and reallocation process happens on the ground level, it's mainly not between sector shifts as where sectors are measured by industries. So, I mean, I think my, my, my line of work with John Haltewinger and others um, made that very clear from the job reallocation side that, that almost all of the reallocation activity happens within narrowly defined industries. 
Um, and that, that part of it was missed by Lillian. I think that's also true in this pandemic, even though it's, it's easy to think, we're, we're very accustomed to thinking about industry defined sectors. And I don't mean to suggest they're not important. There will be some big shifts in this case across industry boundaries, but even, even in this case, most of the shifts are going to occur within industries. So let me give you a couple of concrete examples. Think about what's happened in groceries, okay? Well, there've been huge shifts within the grocery business and companies that are were already kind of well positioned to move into online delivery of groceries because partly because they were already in that space, uh, like Amazon, Kroger, Walmart, or curbside pickup, those companies have been doing great. More traditional grocery stores that didn't have the capacity to move into online delivery quickly and by virtue of their infrastructure and so on, couldn't really handle curbside pickup, they've been hammered. That's a within industry shift. I'll give you another example. There have been um, part because of the pandemic, regulatory barriers to um, remote delivery of medical consultations and healthcare services has exploded in the United States. It was almost non-existent before the pandemic because of regulatory barriers. But when the pandemic came along, all of a sudden it was so obvious that you wanna let doctors do remote consultations so they can talk to say the diabetic patient and make it and say, okay, you need another, you know, you need to adjust your prescription or you need a refill and so on. That kind of thing has become common, okay? In the United States are much more common. I think it will remain so afterwards. But what it means is that there are going to be some medical practices, some clinics that are very adept at responding to the shift to online or remote delivery of, of uh, healthcare consultations and services and others that won't. The ones that make that shift in an adroit fashion, they'll grow and expand. The ones that don't adapt, they'll shrink and some of them will exit. So in the healthcare sector as well, but within the healthcare sector, I think we're gonna be, see large shakeout. Um, same thing's gonna play out um, across in the hotel business. Some hotels are gonna figure out how they can run their businesses in a way that addresses people's lingering concerns about infection risk, about sanitation and so on. And others aren't. Some are gonna be able to accommodate a shift from business travelers to vacation travelers better than others. So here as well, I think that most of the reallocation is going to happen within industry sectors as we normally think about them. And I think that's the part that was missed by Lillian's work. Um, that you know, he really missed the, he missed where most of the reallocation activity was happening. But I think about my work with Haltewinger, I think of that, that work and that kind of, um, uh, and all of the related theoretical and empirical work that, that came either before, after, or during that, 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 part, of the, that part of Lillian's vision has stuck. Uh, and it animates, you know, our basic models of frictional unemployment these days in the, in the mold of, in the mold of um, Diamond Mortensen and Pissarides. So I think a part of the Lillian vision is with us today. It's just his particular implementation of it um, didn't, didn't quite succeed. Okay, so uh, we're running out of time here. I just wanted to thank you. Um, that was a very stimulating uh, presentation and discussion. Um, next week, uh, we're going to be uh, having a presentation from Jesper Linde, uh, who's on leave from the Ricks Bank uh, at the IMF. And he's going to be uh, talking about monetary policy frameworks and, uh, and ECB is considering uh, new frameworks right now. So he's going to be making some, some remarks on that. But uh, anyway, I'd like to Thank you uh, on behalf of all the participants. It was uh, a very stimulating uh, discussion. I can see you're getting two thumbs up uh, yeah, thank, from well, Steve. I, I think that the best, the best part of the the best part of it was the questions and comments I got from you and the audience members. So thanks very much for that. Thank you all. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.